Today we continue in our Easter series, and today we are talking about you cannot redeem yourself. You cannot redeem yourself. So let's go ahead and go before God in prayer. By the way, Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11 will be our reference area. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. And then let's go ahead and go before God in prayer, and then we'll get right into our message. Father, we are very thankful for all that you do for us. We're thankful for the way that you love us. We're thankful for the patience and the forgiveness that you offer us. Because, Father, we know that in all reality, we just don't, we don't deserve it. We have done nothing for it, yet you love us, and so you offer it. Father, we know that we can't redeem ourselves. But we need to be reminded of that oftentimes. And there are also people, Father, that need to hear the fact they need to be redeemed. So I pray that you will be with us this morning, that you'll open our, our ears, and that our mind will receive your word so that it can take and make the changes in our lives that we need. Bless us now and be with us, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. All right, so we've been in our Easter series now for three weeks. And if you've missed the last two weeks, here's what I'm encouraging you to do. I encourage you to go online to our church website, which by the way is on your bulletin. Go to the website, click on the uh, sermons tab, and go back and listen to the last two weeks so that you can catch up and kind of see where we're heading. I don't want anybody to become tone deaf to the biblical account of the resurrection because it is the greatest event that has ever happened in the history of the world, and it should be thought of, and it should be seen as as such by everybody. And for that reason, we are looking at what leads us all the way up to the cross and to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from a different angle. We've been looking at it all three weeks from a different angle, but this week it might sound a little bit more familiar in some of the passages that we read. However, it is still my prayer that you will hear it in a different way with new ears, with new enthusiasm, and with a new desire and resolve to become the person that God wants you to become and to remain that person. So last week, we talked about the triumphal exit. The children of Israel were led out of Egypt, out of the bondage of Egypt. They had been there for 430 years living in the land, and they were finally exiting the land, and they were heading home. They were heading to the promised land. But the triumphal exit was not without great cost to the land of of Egypt as well as to the people of Egypt. Pharaoh was not ever going to concede that the God of the Israelite slaves were more powerful than the gods and the goddesses of Egypt, let alone himself, because remember, every Pharaoh believed that he was a living God. However, after God brought 10 devastating plagues upon the land of Egypt, specifically against each and every different God and goddess that was in Egypt to show that not only were they fake, but they were powerless against who he was. Pharaoh not only let them go, but he drove them out of the land. He wanted nothing to do with them. So from the biblical account of Moses and the Exodus, we were able to come to the conclusion that much like the Israelites of old, we cannot set ourselves free. God must do that. Now we can follow him, but he must be in the lead. So, in week one, we talked about Adam and Eve and that we cannot cover our shame. Only God can do that. And last week, as I just said, we cannot set ourselves free. Only God can do that as well. But this week, this week we are going to talk about the second triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into our world. But so there's no confusion. Let me explain what I mean by that phrase, his second triumphal entry into the world. See, his first triumphal entry into the world really was Bethlehem. Now, I think that you would agree with me on this one. On January the 4th, 1967, outside of St. Luke Hospital in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, where I was born at, born by the way, there was no host of angels celebrating, saying glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. Now, I know, I know you're thinking to yourself as you look at me, how could that not happen for him? (laughs) I know you're thinking that. But I am going to just simply shoot in the dark here. And I'm going to guess it didn't happen at your birth either. So we have a whole lot in common when it comes to that. But listen to what happened to Jesus in Luke Luke chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. So hopefully now you can understand that when I read that, I think that is pretty triumphal. Now, that's just my opinion. When Jesus steps out of eternity and into our world in order that he might save mankind from the mess that we brought upon ourselves, that's pretty triumphal. 
So I hope that you can understand that. So now you can understand that when I talk about Jesus coming into Jerusalem, I call that the second triumphal entry. And that's what we're going to be looking at and discussing and maybe going a little bit deeper in today. So when I was in the Marine Corps, I was in the infantry. Now, specifically in the infantry, I was with the 81 millimeter mortars. Whenever we would have patrols or do a mission, we used to receive what's called a sit rep. Now, a sit rep, of course, is just simply a short thing from our platoon commander, and it was short for situation report. In other words, situation report, and by the way, every branch of the service, I'm sure, has them. They probably have their own name for it. We just called it the sit rep. It had three basic pieces of information inside there, and it was one, what's the situation? Two, what's the fix? And three, what's the mission? That's the things that we would receive. So this morning, I want to use the very basic layout of a sit rep, if you will, to begin our sermon. So let's go ahead and start. What is the situation? Well, if we look at the biblical situation that we're talking about, at this point in the passage, we find Jesus preparing to enter Jerusalem in one of the most holy celebrations of all the Jewish people, and that is the Passover celebration. It's the holiest of all. But remember, from last week, we all know where the Passover celebration originated from. It was the 10th plague that came upon the land of Egypt. The death of the firstborn male from Pharaoh all the way down to the very common person inside of Egypt, as well as the firstborn male of all the livestock. Now, the Israelites were told to sacrifice an unblemished lamb. In other words, completely spotless, unblemished, and place the blood on the doorpost and on the overhead where every single Israelite was, or every, every people of God, wherever they were. And when the Lord passed through the land and he saw the blood of the lamb, he would pass over the house. In other words, the blood of the lamb was a sign of obedience to God and what they were called to do. Thus, death would pass them by. Passover was a celebration about being set free from the bondage of Egypt, as well as being spared death as a judgment of God as he passed through the land. So every year from the day that they were in Egypt, even until today as well, the Passover is still celebrated. Now listen to Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. As they approached Jerusalem and they came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying, go ahead to the village and you'll find a donkey tied there with, a, with her colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone, if anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and they will send you right away. So they took, this took place to fulfill what the, was said to the prophet. Say to the daughters of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples did as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt. They placed their cloaks on them, And Jesus sat on them, and a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, Passover was a time of celebration for Jewish families, but it was also a time of sacrifice for the sin of those very same people. So while it was a celebration, it was also a very serious time of reflection. Each year, a father, if he had a family unit with him, or an individual, by the way, if you were not married, would go into Jerusalem, you would go to the temple area, and you would offer your sacrifice to push your sins back for another year. Now, it was not paying for the sins. It was just simply pushing them back. So a father was to teach his son the custom because one day they would be responsible for their family and they would have to do the exact same thing. But remember, and it's imperative that we remember this, remember that the blood of animals could never atone for sin. It was merely an obedient action required by God. It was a reminder that sin brought death into the world and that sin caused the shedding of innocent blood. Now, the Passover meal itself was a reminder of their time in bondage. Now, the reason why the bread was unleavened or had no yeast was because they had to leave in quickness or in haste. Therefore, the yeast did not have time to rise. So all the yeast was removed and the bread had none. Now, biblically, whenever we refer to the to yeast in the New Testament, we're always talking about it really as a form of evil because a little bit of yeast permeates everything and makes its way through. But the herbs were bitter because it was to remind them of the bitterness of the the, uh, bondage that they endured. And the lamb was to be roasted because there was not enough time to boil it and add to that a glass of salt water. And the salt water was to remind them constantly of the tears that was shed while they were waiting for the deliverer to come. 
So to wrap all this together, we find that this is a time as a reminder that sin will eventually lead to absolute bondage and death. And the only way to be freed from bondage was by the hand of God. And the only way to be spared from death was to be marked with the blood of the perfect unblemished lamb. That's what Passover was. All right, so the situation is this. The world and all of mankind is a mess because of sin. They need to have a sacrifice that was so perfect that it would atone for all the sins of all mankind for all time. It had to be a perfect man, right? I mean, according to what God said in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So since the time of the garden, we have been waiting for the deliverer of mankind to come and to save us from our mess so that we could once again have our relationship with our Heavenly Father unhindered because there was no longer a wall there. We needed someone who would remove the barrier that we had put up by our own choice that separated us from the presence of God and the only one that could do that was the Messiah, because the Messiah was God. So that's the biblical situation that we see in this passage as we watch Jesus riding into Jerusalem, getting ready to celebrate the Passover in a way that it had never been celebrated before, nor ever again. But how do we make sense of that today for you and I? I mean, how do we put that in our terms in 2017? In other words, what's our situation today? Well, our situation is a big mess as well. I'm sure you understand that. I mean, we can look in the world and we can say, wow, look at all that sin has accomplished for all of mankind. I want you to consider just a few compilings of some historical facts. Millions of people have been killed in war. Famines have been caused by men due to the pesticides and so on. Famines have been caused by men. Man-made disease, horrific infanticide of 1.4 million babies in the U.S. alone are aborted each year. We have a terrible drug epidemic in our world. We have people who commit crimes against humanity only for the purpose of self-gain. We have boys and girls being exploited in human trafficking. We still have slavery of human beings in many countries around the world as we speak this moment. And the intellectual thinking of the day is that you and I evolved over a period of millions of years, starting with, starting with pond scum, moving all the way through our ape ancestry, and who we are today is because of that, which is simply ludicrous, but nonetheless is the thinking of the day. We have people that teach false things about God, either that there is no God at all, that a false version of God, or you're an idiot if you believe in God. You see, the fact is, in our world today, sanity, individual thinking, and truth are public enemy number one to a morally bankrupt society. But why is this? Why is it like that? Well, there are three major reasons. One, there's no desire to know the true God or his ways. Two, narcissistic thinking. It's all about you. And three, pride. Now, does that sound familiar? See, the fact is, quite frankly, we talked about that last week when we talked about the arrogance of Pharaoh when it comes to knowing God. You see, the thinking of mankind has not changed hardly at all when it comes to this. There are two kinds of people in this world. There are the saved in Christ and there are the lost. However, the lost really can be broken down into three different categories. One of those categories is this. Those who think they are saved, much like the Pharisees of the Bible, who think that they deserve to be saved, that their heritage saved them, that God's lucky to have them on the team, that they don't need to do anything for the Lord or for his kingdom, and that they've done just enough to be good with God and God's happy to have them. That's one group of the lost. Then there's a second group, those who are genuinely seeking to have their life changed by the Lord. They really genuinely want to do better. They want to change their life completely. They want to find forgiveness in the eyes of God. And sometimes they just simply need help to find their way. And that's where you and I come in. The saved in Christ, we are to let our light shine so we can shine the pathway for them to come all the way back home to Jesus. But then there's the third group. And the third group are those who could really care less about God or his ways, period. They just, they don't care. They have no desire to believe in him or to know him. And some will even verbally or physically attack you because you are silly enough to believe. That's the three categories that we have really in the lost. You see, the situation of the world is a mess. And it was a mess in the biblical account that we read today, but it's also a mess today. However, as bad as it is, 
We, the saved in Christ, must remain at work in the kingdom of God and we must never compromise what it takes to be part of that family. Matthew chapter 24, verses 11 through 13. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And so that's the situation that you and I know today. Could it be any more grim than that? Absolutely it can be. And you know the reason why? Because it is. I've only given you a few things that sin has brought to us by our choice into our world. But you know as well as I know that there are many other things. There are hundreds and hundreds of terrible events that happen in the world daily and you and I both know about them. We may know about different things. Our situation is terrible. Those are the facts and they are undisputed. Which by the way will take us this morning to our next point. And that is this, what's the fix? What's the fix? Well, let's start with the time that we're talking about in our biblical context this morning. What is the fix for our mess? Well, it was simple. The Messiah is the fix to the broken relationship of man and God. There's no way in the world that man could redeem themselves. It is impossible. Remember, the blood of animals is only a temporary and symbolic image of the fact that sin is so serious that there must be the shedding of blood, but that blood of the animals did not atone for it. Now, I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. There is nothing cute about sin at all. There is no sin that God says is okay for the rite of passage or anything else. There's no thing, nothing like that at all that God is okay with. If it is against the standards and the precepts of God, there is a punishment, and that is death. Now, I know that seems really mean and terrible. It seems mean and terrible, especially in a society that created safe spaces for people to cry like infants when their voting or their term paper doesn't come back the way they think it should have. So I know it sounds mean, but the fact is, it's called godly justice. He didn't spring it upon us without our knowledge. God laid out a very clear path that he expected us to follow, a very clear standard he expects us to live by, and he laid out a very clear punishment if we decided to do things our own way. It's called godly justice. But in his tremendous and almost unfathomable love that he has for us, he also made his plan to redeem us as well because there was no way that you and I could pay the price. So what kind of love does that for people that are absolutely guilty? What kind of love does that for people absolutely undeserving of redemption? Well, God's love does, his agape love, his unconditional love for you and for me. But for the sake of hearing them this morning, I wanna to read to you a few verses that remind you and I of the things that we could not do for ourselves, but only God could do. So here's what they are. Psalm 51, verses one and two. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. John chapter 1, verse 29. John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There it is again. That love, that love. What kind of love would die for people when they know that they have made their own mess and now they're heading for spiritual death? What kind of love would do that? What kind of love would be that where that spiritual death, the ability to be in the presence of God that would offer themselves to do that? Well, it's God's love. Let me read that to you. 1 Corinthians 13, verses four through eight. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That is the kind of love that would die for you and me. 
when we do not deserve anything but death. So the fix is impossible for anybody other than God because we can't even love that way. The fix, by the way, was for someone, had to be a person, a Messiah to step into our world, live a perfect and unblemished life without any sin whatsoever, and then offer himself up as the sacrificial lamb of God to truly once and for all atone for all the sins of all men of all time. So I say again, the fix is impossible for us. Only God can do it. You cannot redeem yourself. But the fix is not impossible for you and I to receive. Now that's the good news. Which, by the way, will take us to our last point this morning. What's the mission? Well, the fact is I need to break this down into two areas for us to really see it and understand it. Because the mission really is there's a mission for the Messiah and then there's a mission for you and I. So let's go ahead and look at the mission for Jesus first. Jesus is entering Jerusalem to prepare himself for the mission to redeem the world from the bondage of sin. He has stepped out of eternity and into our world. He has taken the very nature of a servant in the form of a man in order that he would be tempted in every way, shape, and form that you and I have and more and still not sin. And at just the right time, the sin of all mankind, past, present, and future, would be laid upon him and the full wrath of God would go against all the sins that was placed upon the Messiah. In other words, he would take our place and pay a penalty that you and I cannot and will not pay. Could you imagine the burden that must have been felt by Jesus to know full well what you were about to go through and to also know full well you didn't have to do this? You see, the fact is, Jesus had a choice. You see, you and I were created in his image and in his likeness. We have free will to choose only because he has free will to choose. And the fact is, he didn't have to carry out the mission. At any time, he could have said, enough's enough with this group. I'm done. He could have done it at any time. But that's not at all what he did. You see, the mission was of the utmost importance to him. Why? Because he loved us so much. And there it is again. The love, the whole concept of love, the amazing love that he has for us. Listen to Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. I want to make sure that you heard that, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. What joy could possibly be found in the brutality of a Roman crucifixion? It is still to this day in 2017 marked as one of the most horrific ways of dying due to the excruciating beating and the ripping of flesh. It was horrible. It was terrible. What joy set before Jesus would have caused him to choose brutality and crucifixion when he did not have to? Why did he continue the mission of doing something so horrific and going through such torture? Well, the answer is found in the person next to you. The answer is found in the person you see every morning when you look in the mirror. The joy set before him had your name and my name written all over it. He continued the mission for us. It was a joy for him to make a way back home that we could choose to come if we wanted. And that's an amazing sacrificial love. I think of the chorus of Hillsong's song today that Alicia sang, and I think does better than Hillsong. I think of the chorus when I consider what he did for us. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. See, the only way that mission was going to be carried out was by God alone and only by God. And so Jesus continued his journey into the city of Jerusalem to become the only sacrificial lamb of God to take away all the sins of the world. But what about us? What's our part of that mission? Well, considering all that Jesus endured in our place, our part of the mission really is quite simple. It's just as simple as that. 
All we have to do is respond out of love, honor, and praise and obedience to him. We respond to his invitation to be cleansed of our sin, to receive a gift that he paid for with his own blood. And why would I not want to respond to his invitation to receive the free gift of salvation? To have all my sins removed from my record, to be restored to the original grace for which I was born, to be restored to the original place that God always had for me in his family. Why would I not want to do that? Why in the world or what in the world would keep me from accomplishing my simple part of the mission to just respond to Jesus? Well, the answer to that is not only simple, it's sad. Me. I'm the only thing that can stop me from doing it. You're the only thing that can stop you. You see, it's not only simple, it's sad that we won't accomplish our mission of receiving the free gift of salvation that God has offered to you and I. It's just you and me. It's the worldly thinking of Pharaoh that keeps us from the mission. No desire to know the true God or his ways. Narcissistic thinking, I'm, I'm good enough the way I am. And three, pride. You got this thing. You don't need to have the crutch of Jesus in your life to make it through. You got your own brilliance. You got your own plan. You got your own facts. You have yourself. You can do this. You got it. Now, the fact is, to people who really think this way, as I said earlier, to them, sanity, individual truth thinking, and truth is public enemy number one to a morally bankrupt person. And people that think they don't need Jesus are morally bankrupt. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, Bob, that's a little bit harsh. I mean, I believe in God. I just haven't responded to his plan of salvation yet, but I mean, I'm doing okay. Well, you're right. That wouldn't be a Pharaoh thinking. That would be a Pharisaical thinking. That would be a Pharisee thinking. And why? Well, because you believe that what you do for God is good enough, that God's lucky to have you in here right now to be on his team. He's lucky to have you gather with the saints whenever you do, if you do. He's lucky to have you give any kind of money, whether it's a tithe or otherwise. He's just good. He should be happy that you're doing anything at all for him. That certainly isn't the thinking of Pharaoh. That's the thinking of a Pharisee. You think that the way you do worship is good enough. But you have to see Here's the problem with that kind of thinking. God loved us so much that he endured all the redemptive work of the cross at Calvary. And since he has already accomplished what we could not accomplish for ourselves, he most certainly does not need to accept what you think is good enough. And he won't. The fact is, he will accept nothing less than a complete surrender and obedience to his standards, to his will. That's our personal mission if we are saved in Christ. So we start with our own lives, getting our own lives in order. And then we carry that message to the world, to all those still stuck in the bondage of sin because they cannot set themselves free. They need Jesus. A gathering of friends at an English estate almost turned tragic when one of the children strayed off into the deep end of the water. The gardener in the area heard the cries of the young lad and plunged into the water to rescue the drowning child. The youngster's name was Winston Churchill. His grateful parents asked the gardener what they could do to reward him. He hesitated and thought for a minute, and he said, I would love for my son to be able to go to college one day and be a doctor. Well, we will see to it, the Churchills actually promised. Years later, Sir Winston Churchill, when he was the prime minister of England, was stricken with pneumonia. The best physician in the country was summoned. His name was Dr. Alexander Fleming, who discovered and developed penicillin. He was... Not only, he was also the son of the gardener who had saved Winston when he was drowning. Later, Churchill would remark publicly, quote unquote, rarely has one man owned his life twice to the same person. Now, while Mr. Churchill was actually talking about the gardener of his youth who saved his life, the statement from a spiritual sense is absolutely not true. Because brothers and sisters, everything we have, everything we could ever be, ever be and everything we do is owned only to the person of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, read these words. In your relationship with others, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, that is our mission. 
That's supposed to be our attitude that in all things we do, we do it to bring honor and glory to our Father in heaven. Brothers and sisters, like Adam and Eve, we cannot cover our shame. Only God can do that. You cannot cover your spiritual nakedness. And like the Israelites of old, we cannot set ourselves free. Only God can do that. We cannot break the chains of bondage. And in our sinful state, we cannot redeem ourselves. Only God can do that. Only He could endure the cross. So how about you today? Would you like to have your sins cast as far as the east is from the west? Well, if you do, that can only be done by God. You cannot redeem yourself. I invite you today to accept the grace of God by faith in what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary's cross and in Christian baptism, bury your old self and arise as a brand new person in Christ, knowing that you're on the road to redemption. See, that's the beautiful thing about Jesus. He's already done all the redemptive work. He's already done all the stuff that you need to have done because you and I can't do it. But the fact is, you can receive it. So what's your choice going to be?